Thomas McGraw, the licensee, hit the deck when the bullets started flying. By the bar, a lone gunman was pumping bullets into two of his friends. The licensee had had better days. The scene was the Royal Oak Bar in Nitz Hill in the south of Glasgow. It was early in 2004 and the licensee was there to invest in a slice of that part of the city. As far as he was concerned, there was a situation vacant. The year before, the top man in the south side, Stuart's Becky Boyd, had died in a car crash in Spain. Two women and a young girl died with him. Tragic. Boyd had been visiting Paul Johnston and his wife Marie Johnston, an ex-cop, was in self-imposed exile and on the run from charges in Scotland. The Johnstons and Boyd ran Guardian Security and Paul Johnston faced charges of brutality and corruption. Life in prison wasn't good for an ex-cop, not even for a bent ex-cop. The last person to drive the death car before the crash was Paul Johnston. He claimed that he warned Boyd that the brakes seemed a bit dodgy, but Boyd was a careful driver and had plenty of high-spec cars to choose from. Boyd would use a safe motor for sure. His family friends and many street players weren't convinced his death was an accident. Back in Glasgow, the lucrative territory of the south side was up for grabs. Boyd's deputy, John McCartney, was known as the world's richest dustbin man because for years he kept working as a dustbin man while also working the streets in a much more sinister way. He was going to buy the Royal Oak, Boyd's symbolic headquarter. With him, he had a new boy on the block, Craig Davlin. The pair were in cahoots with the licensee who wanted a share of that scene. No problem. The licensee would drive them there and straight into hell. The gunman knew McCartney and Devlin were due at the pub to discuss buying it. He quickly came through the door, marched straight up to the two and started blasting, firing low because he knew they'd be wearing bulletproof vests. If he had known the licensee was there, the casualty rate would have been three that day. The first the cops knew about the shooting was when they stopped the licensee's jeep speeding down through the city streets. In the back were McCartney and Devlin, bleeding all over the upholstery, barely conscious. The two men lived, but at some cost. McCartney had been shot several times in the genitals and limped still. But he had worse than that to put up with, because the street folk gave him a new nickname, No Balls. A few weeks later, the Royal Oak was torched in a professional job, and a few days after that, it was razed to the ground and not a brick was left. It looked like an old trick. It looked like the time the cops were going to forensically check the licensees pub the caravel and it disappeared overnight. What did they have to hide at the Royal Oak? The licensee had been close to coming a cropper, the closest he had come in years. What was he doing driving his own car without his usual minders? Over the past year, his three main henchmen, Trevor Lawson, Gordon Ross and Billy McPhee, had all died bloodily. No one wanted their jobs. The wages weren't worth an early death. So the licensee had had to drive himself. He was more vulnerable than he had ever been before. His usual dose of paranoia was now mixed with self-pity. In recent months, he had taken to drinking heavily and frequently. He was hanging around pubs and clubs trying to pick up young women. The love of his life, his wife Margaret, the jeweller, and the real brains had had enough and split with him. The licensee was lonely and about to become lonelier. Another of his top men, Fast Eddie McCready had been caught with a massive amount of drugs and jailed big time a couple of years before. Street players reckoned that McCready was set up by the licensee, sacrificing some deal with the cops. From prison, Fast Eddie contacted us, saying that he too thinks his boss stitched him up. Alive and kicking, McCready intends to reveal a lot about McCraw, his business practices over the past 20 years, his relationship with the cops, the deals struck, the bodies traded, the works. Thomas McGraw is not a happy man, not on the street and not at home. The loss of his mind is and his wife Margaret has made him shakier than ever and has been far from happy. Mind you, she always played around with cop partners or young local men. McGraw knew about it and was often goaded mercilessly because of it, but mostly he just put up with it. Margaret the jeweller wasn't just the brains, she wore the trousers as well. To be fair to McGraw, he has tried. In 2002, when I'd been recalled to prison, I had the minute consolation of knowing that he was in agony. The reason for his pain was nothing serious. He had just had all his teeth replaced by those fancy jobs they screw into the bone of your jaw. Since then, he's had a nip here, a tuck there, as if he's chasing his youth that's long gone. If you don't believe me, compare the picture of him being released from his drug trial in 1998 with one of him now. One man looks old, worn out and ill. The other looks 20 years younger. McGraw has tried hard all right, but it hasn't worked. Around Christmas 2004, he was nabbed by some traffic cop. 
He was well pissed in his Jeep in the city centre, waiting for some young floozy to come out of the club. The old licensee would have traded some shooters and the charge would have been wiped from the police computer. The new licensee went to court in June 2005, got a heavy fine and lost his driving licence. In his business, that's like losing your legs. Has he lost all his friends, even the ones in uniform? A few months later, he was spotted in the Black Bear pub, a nice wee place out of Glasgow Zoo in the east end of the city. On his own, he drank round after round of large vodkas and coke, staring into his glass as if hoping he'd find some answers there. Two young guys eventually came and joined him. After a long confab in hushed voices, the licensee one began to grumble and rose to his feet. If that place any torch, there'll be effing trouble, he screamed. The two youngsters just shook their heads pittingly and quietly left the pub. Things aren't working out for McGraw. He's lost his wife, he's lost his driving licence and lost his influence. But has he lost his other licence? The one to commit crime? No chance. He's just playing by different rules. That was a chapter outside, uh, out of Paul Ferris's fantastic vendetta turning your back on crime. And it was a chapter that was about Tam the licensee McGraw, which I thought would, could be quite interesting as we just had the one on Mark Clinton, which covered an aspect of that time. When Paul wrote that, Tam the licensee McGraw was still alive. He's obviously passed now. Condolences to his family. Um, but this is quite a significant chapter within the book. Bearing in mind, we've just done the Mark Clinton book. The next episode up I have is Back to London. It is a big episode on Roy Pretty Boy Shaw, but it's the younger years before all the fighting out to, after his big long prison sentence. This was his early years in Borstal, his first prison sentences, his boxing career under the pseudonym Roy West, uh, up to the big armed robbery that he took place. Um, which saw him get sentenced to 15 years behind the door. So I look forward to doing that one with you. Okay, take care.